I am Weatherly Stroh, an equestrian artist, oil painter, and landscape artist, and retreat host. Hello, I'm Chris Stafford, and this is Art, the podcast where we get to know women from around the world of visual arts. This is Season 2, Episode 15. My guest this week is the equestrian artist, oil painter, landscape artist, and retreat host, Weatherly Stroh. Her unique palette and eye for horses brings a soft light to her work, as she captures the gestures and movement of her subjects. She says, My paintings reflect the inspiration I find in the world around me, with a deep appreciation for slowing down to capture and appreciate the everyday magic that surrounds us. Weatherly was born and raised in Metamora, Michigan in 1974. The youngest of four children, which included two step-siblings, to Gary Melcher Stroh and Suzanne Stroh. Her parents' love of horses brought them together and they subsequently conveyed their passion for riding to a young Weatherly, who became a competitive rider. Her mother is also an artist and sculptor who instilled an artistic eye in her daughter, so it was not surprising that after high school at Cranbrook Kingswood in Michigan, Weatherly chose to major in art and photography at the University of Colorado. Whilst in college, she spent a year in Florence, which stoked her interest in travel as well as inspiring her art. After college, she pursued various personal and professional directions, including racing mountain bikes, working for a magazine, a non-profit organisation, and teaching elementary school. It was during her 20 years in Colorado that Weatherly would also negotiate a divorce before she made a decision to relocate to Florida in 2011, where she has established herself as a professional artist. When she's not in her studio in Wellington, Weatherly is riding, playing tennis, and organizing Art of Life creative retreats. Weatherly, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, all of those things that you do, equestrian artist, I mean, a retreat host, but I think most important is that you have a dog, Baxter, who would like to be on the show. (laughs) Baxter is my rescue pup I adopted last September. He is from Alabama. He's a black mouth cur mix. And um, so you might hear him barking occasionally in the background. There's a lawnmower nearby. He he likes to bark at the on guys <laughs> he might just want a cameo on the show okay and i'm curious because i have never come across your name before so i'm sure you've heard that a number of times so where does weatherly originate so i was named after a sailboat it was an, an america's cup winner from the 60s and my parents the story goes that my parents told me my parent, my dad was a big boater and he was in the Navy and my parents were on one of the Great Lakes in the early 70s and supposedly saw the weatherly that was being transported from location to location and thought it was a beautiful name. And both of my parents were horseback riders. And so my mom, according to according to my mom, she was pregnant at the time and she had a name for me if I was going to be a boy. And didn't have a girl's name. And so when they saw the Weatherly, they thought, oh, that would be a great name for a horse or a daughter. And so here I am. Well, we'll talk about the riding in a moment, because obviously that's in the family. But where does the Stro part of your name come from? So my family is, my dad's family originally was from Germany outside of Stuttgart. And they emigrated in the 1800s. Um, and were they were involved in brewing beer in in Germany and brought their trade to uh, Detroit, Michigan. And so I am the fifth generation of our family business that unfortunately we no longer are involved in the beer business. But um, yes, we were German German roots. And your father Gary is no longer with us. So what was your relationship like with him as you were growing up, Weatherly? He was a really, he was a neat man from what I remember. I was, 
pretty young um, when he passed, but he, I think now the, the older I get and the more people that I talk to about him, it sounds like we're very, we're similar that we had a lot of interest in animals and the outdoors and being in nature. And um, I think he, he was very passionate about his hobbies and he worked for our family's business um, actually during prohibition when we could no longer brew beer we had an ice cream division and so my dad took that over when he was an adult and so he was the chairman of the ice cream ice cream department and then was also involved with the beer business um as a board member so he had a lot of different skills going on (laughs) and he rode you say both parents rode Yes. So one of my dad's hobbies was riding horses and he showed a little bit. Um, He actually met my mom when they were, I grew up north of Detroit in a small town called Metamora, Michigan. And my parents were out trail riding at the barn and and met each other and fell in love. And um, they both, they shared that love, lifelong love of horses. And um. Yeah, actually, my dad's dad was a polo player, and my dad didn't play polo, but he rode English and and showed hunters, as did my mom. And so was it a natural progression then for you to get in the saddle at a young age? Was it expected? It was, yes. We So we grew up in the country, um, so it was, it was horse country, and I grew up going to the barn with them and on the weekends, and of course, was introduced to riding at a young age with the hopes that I would follow in their footsteps and got, I was fortunate enough to be able to ride ponies growing up and um, kind of progressed from there and just fell in love with it as they had. And so it's been really a part of my life, um, often on my entire life. I've taken breaks at times, but somehow the horses draw you back and... I feel like they're such amazing creatures and they're so helpful with grounding and keeping you present and have lots of lessons to teach you as, as that can help you with life. So, Well, that was growing up in Michigan, north of Detroit, where you, where you were born and raised. How, how long were you living in that area before you moved south? So I grew up... Um, there until about when I was 17, I went to college and I left uh, Michigan for Colorado and lived in Colorado for 20 years. And then started coming down to Florida where I currently live um, in 2011 and had, had gotten back into riding and showing. And so I would come here for winters to compete and, um, Along that same, around that same time, I was going through some personal changes and a divorce and needed to make some life changes. So I ended up moving back to Michigan, but would come to Florida still to, in the winter time. And, um, and then about 2000, it was probably about 2016, 2017, I decided to move here full time. I had been living in Michigan in the the winters just got to me and couldn't, I couldn't quite handle it anymore. And I realized I could work from anywhere. And so many of my clients were part of the horse world and a lot of my friends from growing up, I still maintained those friendships. So it, it made sense. So I've been here about, I guess, six or eight years full time. So let's just step back into Michigan f- for a while. And so we get to know a little bit more about your family, your mother, Susie. Who was a homemaker, an interior designer, also artistic. Tell us about your relationship with her. She actually lives in Florida, with uh, fairly close by, which is really nice. Um, she's inc- an incredible artist, and I think uh, she was a big influence on me growing up. She would. Um, we had this neat old farmhouse that was like over a hundred years old, and she would do we collected animals. We had various strays and dogs that were dumped on our property. And so I think at one point we had six dogs and she would, each of our animals, whether it was horses or dogs um, and various cats, she would, she would do pencil drawings of. And so the stairwell lining our farmhouse was lined with her, her drawings, which were incredible. 
And so I, I remember her, you know, doing that as a kid. And then when I was in high school, she started doing some interior design work, which she has a, she has a great creative eye for design and really um, making spaces very beautiful and welcoming. And then probably about 15 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, she, she segued into bronze sculpture and that's what she's doing now. She does bronzes. She also does stone sculpting and some clay ceramic work. Um, and she's 76 now and is, she spends a few weeks every year in Marble, Colorado, sculpting stone and she's she's talking about going to Pietra Santa Italy to go stone carve with some experts there and it, so it's it's very inspiring that she is you know she's really diving full on into her creativity so what mediums were you dabbling in then as a small child before you got into oil painting and the things that you're doing now so when I was in high school we had I went to a really amazing high school that um, called Cranbrook Kingswood. And there was a graduate school that was a- affiliated with it that was for artists, visual artists. And so the high school that I went to had, we had everything from jewelry design to ceramics, to dance, to music. Um, I took some drawing classes. I took a really fabulous painting class. I took a bunch of photography classes, a weaving class, a jewelry design class. I think I think I tried to take pretty much every opportunity to take a a fine art class that I could. And it really exposed me to some incredible artwork from my fellow students. Um, But I kind of took it for granted that I just assumed that that was part of school. And so um, I realized later that I was very fortunate to have that exposure. and then I decided to go to the University of Colorado for college and didn't really know what I was going to study and was in a liberal arts program um, in these large 300 person classes, just feeling a little lost. And I knew I always loved art. So I decided to try to get into some of the art classes. And the only way I could take art classes were if I declared art as my major. And so I, I did. And um, I took one painting class that it did not gel with the professor and it wasn't my style and it just wasn't up my alley. So I switched and started taking more photography classes and ceramics classes and ended up graduating with an art degree in photography and ceramics. And um, now I realize the photography has really influenced my painting and how I look at composition and light and what I look for when I, start a painting um i think i'm always looking i'm still looking with the photographer's eye of of what interests my what interests me and what captivates me did you think at any time then that you might have become a photographer instead of a painter i think for a a little while i did an internship with an amazing photographer in colorado um i really had no idea what i wanted to do and when i grew up and i I I couldn't see how to make art as a business. Um, I didn't. We weren't given the skills in school to really learn how to market ourselves or really make a living at it. And so I think in my twenties, I got away from my art entirely and did a variety of other pursuits. I raced mountain bikes professionally. I worked at a a bicycling magazine. I worked at a nonprofit um, and just kind of tried a bunch of different things, which, but I, but I realized during that time also that I would always go back to my painting. And I, even though I didn't take a lot of painting classes in college, I still enjoyed taking a workshop here and there. And I would pick up my paintbrushes every so often and very inconsistently, but it kept cu- calling me back. So um, I just, I think I couldn't quite wrap my head around like what, what direction I would go with it. So I never really put 
the time or effort into it. But interestingly, given your riding background uh, in your youth, you didn't think on during this period in your 20s, you didn't consider a, a riding career, training, teaching? No, I didn't. I rode very competitively when I was a junior, um, when I was 17, 18, and got very kind of burned out. Sorry, that's Baxter playing with a toy looking for a little attention. <laughs> Um, I got very burnt out from the sport and just really wanted to kind of start over in Colorado, finding my own way away from my family and away from, you know, everything that I grew up with. I, I figured I would just start start anew. And it's funny. I, and then periodically I would go back to the horses and I would get stuck back in. And so I think... I took about a 17 year hiatus from riding horses. And as I started to go back and start riding again, and it was along the same time that I was starting my paint, starting to become the painter full time. And it's kind of amazing how it slowly just evolved from there that horses came back into my life and the art became a more important part of my life. And I was able to just, I really, it was kind of, it, it happened gradually, but I, um, when I first started painting full time, I, a friend of mine asked me to, I was painting some landscapes at the time. And a, a, I had a friend who had just lost her yellow lab. And she asked me, she said, would you paint a portrait of Georgia for us? And I was like, uh, I've never done that before, but sure, I'll try it. And so it's, I did one painting for, some friends and then they had me do another one for a friend of theirs and it just kind of built from there and as I started writing I would have clients friends that would become clients and have me paint do a portrait of their horse and then it just by word of mouth kind of built from there and turned into a fairly nice you know career well, it seems to have all come together very nicely for you now. Do you feel this is where you were meant to arrive, and and this is this is uh, this is the the present and the future for now? I really do, and I never, I don't think I really ever could have imagined it, but it, I can't now imagine doing anything differently, and I feel like I've kind of honed in my my niche of equestrian paintings and you know horses and I'm able to combine what I love doing from a hobby standpoint as well as a career and now we've added some retreats as well which I can talk about later but I, one of my other passions is travel and so I feel very very fortunate to be able to really blend my my hobbies and career and connections and friendships and it's really they all I feel like is very complementary to one another. What was your mother's reaction to you finding your career path in this way? She was always very very supportive. I think um, she has been a lifelong passionate horsewoman, and so I think. As I started riding again, she was always very supportive of that. And um, as an artist, fellow artist, I think she's, I think she's really, I think she's really enjoyed seeing my path and my growth and seeing where I've taken it. And um, it's fun. So where my studio is now in Wellington, it's I set it up as a gallery and studio and have events there. I'll have open studios and. It's perfect because I have her sculptures on display there as well. And it's, they complement my paintings quite nicely. And I feel like it completes the space in some ways. Does she go riding with you at all? Unfortunately, she can't, she doesn't ride any longer. She has had um, back surgery and neck surgery and a fusion and hip replacement. And so um, she does not ride any longer, although she may try to go for a trail ride and just go walk with us um, at one point. But she, um, I think she misses it, but at least she's she's able to be around the horses and enjoy it um, from a different perspective now. 
Let's just go back to something you mentioned earlier, how when you were in your 20s, you actually did mountain bike riding professionally. Yes. Talk more about how that came about. Well, I think, you know, grow, I'm the youngest of four kids. Um, my dad had two families from two different wives, and I'm, so I'm the youngest of um, all four of us. And I think, I think I, as a result, I was a fairly competitive kid and you know competing with the horses growing up i think when i got to college i I was looking for a competitive outlet and in boulder everybody is there's so many amazing athletes there you're surrounded by runners and cyclists and i got into mountain biking in college and really loved the challenge of it and the physicality of it and we had a club team in college that I became friends with a number of the, the members of and so we would go and travel to races and it was it was similar to horse showing in in the in the sense that you go to these interesting towns and spend it the night and have dinner together and then race and then come home and it just gave me a sense of purpose and challenge and I like to push my limits and see how far I could go and so after college I continued racing and um, ended up racing professionally for about two years. And I, I kind of came to the realization that, you know, I got to a certain point, I think that it was beyond where I thought I could go. And I, in some ways, proved that to myself and then realized that in order to become even more successful within that new category and I would have to make a lot more sacrifices and be a little bit more myopic with my lifestyle and I than I was willing to do. And I, I realized I'm like, I need a little more balance than um I think this offers. So I stepped away from it and then um you know I'd still ride for fun when I was living in Colorado and it was it just kind of I think once I had turned professional, it lost some of the fun. And so I kind of tried to recapture that as I stepped away. Did you win any titles that we would know about? Probably not. <laughs> I won a couple of local races. Um, I did actually a couple of World Cup races, which were fun. Um, but I really, I got, I, I like to say I was like the the worst of the the top group. I was at the bottom of the top group. So I um, did not, I, I'm also six feet tall and most of the women that I was racing against um, were tiny. They were, you know, five, five, two and five, three. And so I, I think, I don't think it was quite the right sport for my build. I think I would have been better as a tennis player, a volleyball player. <laughs> Do you ever feel like getting on a bike again and doing that? You know, when I lived in Michigan, I would I would still mountain bike a fair amount, and it was really fun. And um, now that I live in Florida, the trails are a little bit farther away, and I think I would probably still enjoy it, but I just don't have the time. Um, so I don't I don't really miss it. I, I've started playing a little more tennis, which is nice because it's my social outlet and gives me some exercise and it, it's very accessible. It's easy. You know, it's five minutes, five minutes away from my house. Well, you're in Florida. It's a good place for tennis. It is. It definitely is. <laughs> and what else? Because this is a pretty full schedule already. What else do you do for fun? It is a very full schedule. And I was just thinking this morning how I need to try to simplify things. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know what's going to give. Um, Travel is a big part of my life. I love, I do love to travel. Um, I love to, I'm an avid reader. Um, I don't get to the beach as often as I would like, but I do enjoy going periodically. And there's a great dog beach about a half an hour, 40 minutes from where I live. And so I take Baxter there on occasion. And I have this great vision. He likes to, he likes the water. And so I keep thinking that he'll go swimming in the ocean and he's actually more interested in just digging in the sand and rolling around and <laughs> playing with friends than swimming. Well, 
Well, you mentioned being an avid reader, and, you know, we love book recommendations here on the show. So tell us what you're reading now. I just started a book called, I think it's called Tomorrow, Tomorrow, Tomorrow. And I'm not very far into it, but it so far seems pretty interesting. I think it's called, yes, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. It's Gabriel Zevin. Nathan, I'm probably butchering his name. Um, so that that's kind of drawing me in. I also just finished a book by Arthur Brooks called From Strength to Strength. And that one, I'm, that one was really, that was good also. And it's just kind of, it talks about how I think as a society, we're getting away from our, where our, what brings us happiness and how, you know, trying to eliminate distraction versus trying to be everywhere at once and do everything that we think culturally we're supposed to do. And so that's one thing I'm working on in my business is trying to get back to what really lights me up and excites me. And I think it's, it's finding a balance of what, where my strengths are and, you know, also obviously trying to grow my business and, you know, continue with some good momentum of um, new clients and new exposure and new connections. And I think it's hard with social media now because it's a, at least for visual artists, I think it's, it's such a wonderful way to get the word out and the, the, our, our, are out the world, but it's, it can also, as we know, can be such a distraction. So it's, it's, uh, that's one of my biggest, I think, goals this year is to try to figure out ways to be less distracted and a little bit more focused when I'm in my, in my studio and in my zone. Well, that brings me perfectly to my next question, Weatherly, although you didn't know it. (laughs) And that is how you get into your zone with all of these and, interests and activities is this a daily discipline and how do you transition when you go into the studio to get into your zone so during our busy season in wellington which is we're just finishing up our winter season so january through march is very busy here with horse shows and a lot of people coming from the north and so it's i find that i don't i'm not as regular I'm not painting as regularly as I would like during the season. And I've come to realize, I've learned to just accept it. And now as the season slows down and into the summer when it's much quieter here, that's, I feel like a much more, a better time for me to focus in my studio. And I'm, I'm trying to get better about really chunking out larger pieces of time where I can, just be in my studio without distractions and I have a safe that I use when I'm in my studio um, that I can lock my phone in and so I can't access it at all which is great (laughs) so that's one thing I'll do I have started meditating a little bit more regularly and so I'll I'll think about my intention for the day and my intention for my paintings as I sit down to work on them I try to really just take take a few moments before I start to visualize what I want to create and where I want the painting to go and um think about what's important it's funny so in in my studio I have a a sign it says when it's this really neat antique that's kind of falling apart but it's it's win and you know i i think in my past i used to be so competitive that when i got it it, i represented like competition and like being my best and now it's shifted and i think i look up at the sign it's right above my easel and now i interpret it as what's important now w-i-n and i really try to think about that as as i'm starting is just what what's my intention what do i want to emphasize and what's what what is most important to me to express in that moment um 
So the other rituals that I'll do is I'll, I'll sit quietly and meditate for a few minutes before I start. I sometimes light candles or incense and try to just clear my head from all the chatter that's outside my studio. Um, sometimes I'll listen to some music. Actually, I usually, I usually listen to music. I usually listen to, uh, depending on my day, either some classical music, if I just don't want a lot of noise, um, or I'll listen to some, you know, music from the 70s, 80s, and just have it. I don't, I don't listen to it very loudly, but it's nice background music and just, you know, something soothing. So um, other times if I'm working on a larger piece and not as uh, not as much concentration, but if I'm just filling in larger spaces, I can I'll listen to some pop music to give me some, you know, give me some energy and and that sort of thing. Um, and then Baxter's usually at the studio with me. So he he's actually learning to be a really good studio dog. I'll give him a bone or something to chew on and he'll chew on that for an hour or so. And then he usually takes a nap and when he gets restless, I know it's time for me to take a break and go out for a walk. And <laughs> So is this morning or afternoon then? When do you fit in the riding? Are you a morning rider or an evening rider to avoid the heat? Usually morning. So um, today, Mondays, we have off. The barn's closed, so I won't ride on a Monday. So that's usually my longer studio day. I'll, um, and then Tuesdays through Sundays are, are riding days, and I try to go Usually first thing is if I can get it in before it's hot and before, um, sometimes it depends on our show schedule also. So our horses do, I train with a farm that's based out of Brewster, New York. And so the horses will head up North here in a few weeks. And so I'll miss the daily riding, but it will give me more concentrated time in the studio, which I think will be great. And I'll be just meeting up with my horses periodically um, when I can on weekends. So it adds a little bit of complexity, but it also frees up week time during the week, which is great. So anyone who's listening who may be familiar with the Wellington world of horses, do you want to name your trainer? Yes, I ride with um, Hannah Isop and Tracy Friels. They're Parkway Farm out of Brewster, New York, and they're just lovely. They've uh, I started riding with them last year and they're just really wonderful people to work with. And I'm learning a ton and they've helped my young horse really come along and come into his own, which has been fun to, fun to process to be a part of. Well, you mentioned to me earlier that you now have a second ride, but what's your main ride? What, what classes were you doing with him? So Henry is my young horse. He's turning eight and I show him in the, I showed him in the adult amateurs and three, three amateurs, amateur owner hunters. Um, so my goal is to eventually get back to the three, six amateurs, but I need a little more consistency and <laughs> more practice. So we'll get there. So when you get into your studio and you've got horses on your mind and now are, are you painting commissions for the most part or are, they, are these, or come, are they coming for you? Is it a balance now? It's a balance now. I, when I first started, I only did commissions and I've so, slowly segued into, I take about 10 to 12 commissions a year. I try to limit it at that. And then I do the rest of the time, the rest of the time will be my own work. And so it's, it's a mix. Um, this week I'm leaving town and next week. So I have two fairly large commissions that I'm trying to complete if possible, which I'm one is almost one's about 90% done and the other one's about 70% done. So I think I think I can finish those up this week. And for the most part, you're painting in oils now. Yes, I do. Um, when I travel, I'll bring some water based gouache, which I really love. It's an opaque water based medium. And it acts similar to oils that um, it's not, it, it's, um, but it's nice because you, it's very immediate and you can, you know, you don't, you don't need any solvents to clean your brushes. You, you can just use water and it's, I still bring a travel journal and some gouache paint, which I love. And then 
I sometimes will play with acrylics. I haven't used them a lot, but I'll use them as an underpainting occasionally and then paint over with the oils um, just for, for speed. Um, the oils, you know, take a little bit of drying time. So if I'm working on a painting, I need to, I'll do a layer and then I, they typically need a day or two to dry at least the top, top layer of them. And so the acrylics, I'd like to start playing more with those and just getting more of a base down with the acrylics and then building up the layers with the oils once, once that's finished. Well, as someone who, as a little girl, always wanted to draw her pony and never could, I'm very envious of how you capture horses in, in movement. They really are beautiful. And your color palette, too. Is that something you feel your color palette is part of you as a person? Very much so. I think it's evolved um, over time as also. But I really, I think living in Florida, I think my colors are there some of them are more vibrant and blues and greens and i those are the colors that i always gravitate towards and i'll wear in my clothing my wardrobe is is similar and i um i find them very soothing and so yeah i think i think it's um Yeah, I think I think they they complement one another, and um, especially with I do a lot of gray horse paintings, and I think it's fun just playing with as many colors within the grays that you can imagine with the light and the shadows, and rather than just having it be you know a, a gray and white painting of a, a horse, it's it's much more there's much more richness to the light and shadows. So that's what I'm trying to capture when I'm working what sort of things would your art teachers have said to you in your formative years as an artist weatherly oh that's interesting i had well it's funny i took a workshop um this would have been in my 20s with an, a gentleman he's an amazing artist he's from utah it seems michael workman and this was before i was painting full-time and he said pick one thing and paint that for a year. And he said it could be light, it could be composition, it could be cows, whatever that thing is. And at the time, I didn't really listen to him. And I think my work has evolved over time where I painted, I have painted a variety of subjects for a long time. And I think it slowly evolved where I'm, I really have focused more especially recently on just the horse paintings and really you know his point was you do one thing and you you have your it forces you to look at it in depth and really extrapolate like what is most important from that if you're if it's light like how can you reinterpret it and how can you make it interesting to your viewer and with horses like how can i paint the same subject over and over and still keep it interesting and keep it fresh. And so I think about that. Um, I think about that a lot, actually, of how can I do, do something the same, but keep it different and unique and still, because I think I need, I need that as an artist to stay interested and to stay excited about what I'm working on. Did your mother, did your parents even take you around art galleries and expose you to artists that might have influenced you as an artist? My great, great uncle on my father's side was named Gary Melchers, and he was an American Impressionist painting, painter from the 1800s. And so when I was a little girl, um, I was actually at a horse show in Culpeper, Virginia, and near, near... Culpepper is Belmont, where Gary Mulcher's home and studio is, and it's now a museum. Um, and so, it, it, so I remember going there and really being kind of in awe of his work. His work is covered; it, it covers the walls of his home, and then he has this magnificent studio in this really beautiful area of Virginia, Fredericksburg, Virginia, and. So we went there when I was a kid, and I still have pictures of it. And so I think that was. I think that got into my subconscious that um, 
of what was possible. And I remember my dad always talking about Gary Melchers and I had, we had books on him and my middle name is actually Melchers. And, um, my dad is Gary Melcher Stroh and I'm Weatherly Melcher Stroh. And so I think, I think that it definitely influenced me. I don't remember going to many galleries as a kid, but I think we had an innate appreciation for art in my family. Um, so Gary Melchers was a painter. His father, Julius Melchers was a sculptor and he did uh, wood carvings. And so my dad in his office had one of his, one of Julius Melchers wood carvings, which was really beautiful. It was this, um, it was like a cigar store Indian. And that's now at the Gary Melchers Museum in Virginia. Um, so I think, I think I was exposed to a lot more than I probably remember or realized, but it had a lot of impact. And you also spent some time in Italy that influenced you and your art and your appreciation for art and also travel, of course. And and we're going to talk about the resorts, uh, retreats that you're organizing now. But what did you take away from that initial visit to, to Italy? How did it impact you? So I spent a year in college in Florence and really fell in love with I, the country, I loved everything about Italy. I loved, I mean, Florence is such a beautiful city. Um, you know, the details on the buildings, the, like every detail, there's no detail that goes unnoticed. And they've, the Italians have such a wonderful zest for life. And whether it's their food, their wine, their buildings, their, the way they dress, the, their charming way about them. And I think I've, since then had a lifelong love for Italy and all things Italian. And I have visited Italy probably two dozen times or, you know, 18, 20 times throughout my life. And one of my fantasies is to eventually live there part or full time. And so, and I try to go paint there yearly and just do some landscape painting it's my way of kind of recharging getting away from the distractions of life and a friend of mine that i went to middle school with we've known each other since we were 11 and her name's lizzie larock she's amazing and she's a dear dear friend of mine we've talked over the years about hosting retreats in italy and just retreats in general and we finally got our acts together last year and hosted our first um, creative retreats in Tuscany. We had one that sold out immediately. So we hosted a second one. So we had back-to-back retreats outside of Lucca, Italy. And Lizzie has a photography background and I have a painting background. And so we combined them and it was, they were real. they were so fun and they're not, geared towards artists at all. And actually, um, the retreats that we're hosting this year, we are, it's a little bit of photography, a little bit of painting, really embracing the culture of Italy. We have wine tasting and cooking classes. We rent really beautiful villas where um, we'll have a private chef cook for us and we'll have daily yoga classes. And it's really about slowing down and savoring life and savoring what Italy has to offer. And we actually, our business is called Art of Life. And um, so we were hosting two retreats this year, one in Sardinia and one in Tuscany in the fall. And then going forward, we're hoping to add locations, possibly Morocco and Greece and Croatia, depending on, um, depending on what we find as we, as we go forward, but they've been really fun. And it's nice because my painting business is a very solitary business and it can get lonely at times being a solo creator. And so I love having a, a colleague and having a business partner and bouncing ideas off of each other. And it's, um, and plus it's just Lizzie's hysterical and she's just, she's fun. She's one of my favorite people in the world. So we, we've, we're really, I think we're, we've, we've had a, had a lot of fun. And I, I, I think, uh, I think it'll be fun to see where it goes. Sounds like really tough to hang out with you, Weatherly. <laughs> <laughs> I 
killed for your efforts tonight. <laughs> and if anyone wants to find out about these retreats, how do they do that? So either on my website, weatherlystro.com, we have a tab uh, for retreats or our website for the retreats is artoflifecreativity.com. And um, yes, please be sure to get on our, wa- our waiting list for future retreats and we'll send out emails as they open up. Um, we do have space for our fall retreat in October in Tuscany, you know, so. So I'm assuming that you've picked up the language too. Are you speaking in Italian? Sadly, when I was in college in Florence, everybody knew I was either American or German and pretty much everyone in Florence speaks English or German. So I didn't have as many opportunities to speak it. Um, and then over the years, I've, I've, I can understand it more than I can speak it. And I think if I really was there for a good chunk of time and forced myself not to speak as much English, I think I would be much better. But Italians are pretty forgiving. You (laughs) say it with a smile and a hand gesture, you usually get your (laughs) message across. Absolutely. Now, looking at your playlist, though, You've got Fleetwood Mac, Tracy Chapman, country, classic, pop, depending on your mood. But I don't see any Italian music. I know. I need to add a little Eros Ramazzotti. And <laughs> so, <laughs> I really should. When you look back, though, Weatherly, you know, we get to where we are based on our experiences in life. And there's the highs and lows. What would have been the major milestones in your life and the turning points that have brought you to this part of your journey? Oh, wow. I think one of the big ones was in 2011, when I was kind of going through this life transition, I was teaching elementary school at the time. And not living where I wanted to be living and not living. I don't think I was living my true life, my true path. And I think as scary as it was to make some major changes, I'm so grateful that I did because it's led me to where I am now. And I think, I think I'm trying to be better and better as I get older to really listen, listen to my intuition and my heart more. And it can be hard to do, as we know, with all the chatter from our media and social media and our lives. But um, so I think that would probably be one of the biggest turning points. And then I think also making the making the change to move to Wellington and have a studio outside my home and and really take it more seriously and and take my business more seriously and and dedicate you know dedicate more time and energy towards towards it i think that's been made a big difference and also you went through a divorce too which is never easy no that would have been in 2011 that was not easy at all it was probably one of the hardest hardest points in my life um and yeah, at that time, I gave myself a year. I, I kind of, in the back of my mind, I said I'd give myself a year to just paint full time and see where it led me. And so, it, as difficult of a time of, as it was, I think it's you know those things happen for a reason. And I think you know, I think I learned learned a lot from it. So, well, as they say, we get wiser as we get older. Yeah. How how would you describe the personality you are now and who you've become? A peaceful person, a patient, content? I think I'm definitely content. I think I'm searching for peace. I think I have a little bit of a lot of my dad in me. And I think he had some anxiety and, you know, I think he had so many interests that he had a hard time balancing it. So I think that's what I I have. I think I've inherited that from him. So it's, I'm trying to find that balance of, you know, quiet time and quality hobbies and quality things in my life and, um, but paring it down and keeping it pretty simple as well. So I think I, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for where I am and, 
Um, and I think I have more confidence now than in my twenties that, you know, and even actually even in the last 10 years from when I started my business to where I am now, I think, I think I trust myself more. And I think I'm, you know, I'm not afraid to ask for something that I might've been a little timid about before. Do you feel more able to say no as well? Oh, that's a, that's a hard one for me. <laughs> that is definitely something I'm working on. Not my specialty. What do you like to hear people say about your art? I like to hear that, you know, that I really capture the essence of a horse or a personality. They can see their personality coming through or that they like the expressiveness of it or um you know they can feel they can feel the emotion that i had or that the horse had and that that's coming through in my paintings and if we were to listen through the door when you're painting and listening to music would we hear you singing occasionally occasionally yeah it depends on my mood i think do you enjoy being musical? Do you play anything? I don't. I sadly am not musical at all. And so singing is not. That's probably why I don't sing very much. Because I have a terrible voice. I didn't really grow up with um, musical instruments or singing a lot. But it seems like life is very well-rounded for you now, Weatherly. Are you in a very content place when knowing that this is who you are and what you are and how you represent yourself. I think I am. I think, yes, I think I'll always be the kind of person that is, likes to learn and grow and, you know, fine tune, but I do think I'm in a really good place. I think, um, yeah, I, I, I feel like my business is in a place where, you know, it's, I put in the time and the energy and the effort and I, I know that I can continue at the pace I'm going and, you know, it's, it's as with that, anything, it's what we make of it. And I think, you know, I think for when I was starting out, I think I had to something to prove and now I don't feel like I have to prove anything. I feel like I'm, you know, I, I enjoy what I do and it's, it's, it's compliment complimentary to the rest of my life which is which is nice and i'm very content being back involved in the horses and having that having having them be in my life again which i i think i had missed well in addition to the retreats that you have planned this year what else are you looking forward to do you have any exhibitions any shows anywhere that we can point to I have um, some work I'm sending up to a gallery that I'm in in Saratoga Springs um, called Spa Fine Art. And so they'll have a number of my paintings and actually a, a number of my mom's bronze sculptures as well. So that will be on display um, starting in May. And then, excuse me, um, later in the summer, I have one of my pieces will be on the cover of a a program for a horse show out in California, the Menlo Charity Horse Show. It's their um and their artist for the for the year. So that's that's fun. Um beyond that, I will be having multiple, you know, studio shows and studio visits, which which will be fun. So it'll be a busy year. It sounds like it. Yes. Well tell everybody how they can find you online and on social media weatherly so my instagram and facebook handle are in our weatherly stro studio and my website is weatherly stro.com and my um yes and like i said mentioned earlier our retreat business is art of life creativity.com well the very best of luck with your busy season ahead, the busy year and the future with your ambitions, both with the retreats and with your artwork and, of course, with your writing, too. Well, and thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Chris. I so appreciate it. And if you scroll down the show notes, you'll find a link to Weatherly's social media and to her website. 
And you'd also find a link to our Instagram account too. You can find us at the Art Podcast, that's art with two A's. If you'd like to reach out to us directly via email, that address is hollowellstudios at gmail.com. That's H O L L O W E L L studios at gmail.com. My thanks again to my guest, Weatherly Stroh, and to you for listening. I'll be back next week when my guest will be the cinematographer and camerawoman Erin Haynes. So I do hope you'll join me then. <laughs>